This may be the most iconic photo of my generation. A lone man standing in front of a convoy of Type 59 main battle tanks. The soul of a protest that wanted to start a revolution. Fierce devotion for liberty against the literal tools of oppression. In 1998, this man was listed as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Important People of the Century. In 2016, this photo was listed by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential images of all time. While the fate of this man shown here remains unknown, with many conflicting reports as to his escape or execution, one thing is certain. The protest failed. We live in a volatile world. Conflict is the norm. Over the past 3,400 years, the human species has only known 268 years of peace. That's over 98% of human history having warfare. Political turmoil seems to be everywhere. Large-scale protests are seen every day. Right now we are witnessing protests in the streets of Iran. Recently the United States had major protests over the police killing of unarmed black men. And you may be asking yourself, where does this all lead? People love talking about revolution. You see it mentioned in the news, insurrection at the capital, a brewing civil war. But most of the time it doesn't come to pass. Why is that? Why do some issues turn into protests? Why do some of those turn into rebellions? Why do some rebellions turn into revolutions? Revolutions and rebellions are intense and provide a wide influx of stories to tell. But the common thinking around them is so simplistic, you don't even realize what you're leaving off the table. Hey, thanks for joining us. Please hit that like button if you're enjoying what I do here, and make sure that you're subscribed. And let me know what you think of this video in the comments section below. I swear, this does apply to TTRPGs, but it's also a broader topic that more people need to be informed about. References to how to implement this into your game will be minimal in this video, but you should have a better understanding of how to do so by the end of it. As a note, I will be making more videos that discuss topics outside of TTRPGs on this channel. However, rest assured, I will always make videos about D&D and other TTRPGs as well. Rebellion and revolution are two words that instantly conjure up images in my head. If I'm being honest, revolution makes me think of the age of revolution, the American and the French revolutions of the 18th century. Rebellion makes me think of Star Wars. <laughs> Look, I'm not all bookie history all the time. Sometimes I'm laser sword goes womp womp. But what I think needs to be understood is that these words mean different but related things. Rebellions can be part of a revolution. Revolutions can occur without a rebellion. And just because there is a rebellion, even a successful rebellion, it doesn't mean that it will cause a revolution. Rebellion comes from the Latin to war again. Revolution, also coming from Latin, means to roll back. It's interesting that these words that define progress or change come from origins of returning or doing things over again. Time is a flat circle. Change is always happening in history. Now here's something that I need everyone to understand. It makes using this in your RPGs easier. It makes understanding the world easier. Everything is systems. Stories or anecdotes that you hear in the news or in history books are the flavor text to the reality of how the world operates. So a political revolution could be a change in the people in charge. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. So just change in the people making the decisions. Or they could be a change in the type of government, but not the structure of the society. A social revolution, for Theta Scotchpole's definition. Really? That, that's how you pronounce it? Scotchpole? Oh, it's Czech. 
Oh, it's pretty cool. A social revolution, per Theta Scotchpole's definition, is a change not only in who's in charge, but a transformation of the society's state and class structures. Oh, sorry, class as in like the proletariat versus the bourgeois, not bard versus cleric. And revolutions don't need to be political. The Industrial Revolution created upheaval and change in social structures without causing any sudden political change. But how to look at what a revolution is can get complicated. So I asked a friend. I'm Dr. Christopher Faulkner, assistant professor at the United States Naval War College. I study uh, revolutions and rebellions. So revolution can maybe broadly be thought of as an effort by some group of the broader population to either violently or non-violently change the status quo, oftentimes with the goal of overthrowing the government. All of these can be an absolute wellspring of drama for your table, but understanding this can do more than just improve your tabletop games. More importantly, understanding this can give you a better frame of reference for the world. And I have some help here. My name is Josh Lambert. My PhD was in security studies, and I focused on the prediction of military coups with machine learning and spatial dynamics. Because I don't just cite experts like some other YouTube essayists. I bring them on the show so they can write part of the script themselves because I'm super lazy. Part 1. Romance versus Reality We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thomas Jefferson, The United States Declaration of Independence, 1776. To better secure and perpetuate mutual friendship and intercourse among the people of the different states in this union, the free inhabitants of each of these states, paupers, vagabonds, and fugitives from justice accepted, shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of free citizens in the several states. The Articles of Confederation, 1777, the United States' first constitution. Stories hold such power. Stories have purpose. I had a book of Aesop's fables when I was a kid. Those stories were meant to instruct and teach. It is understood that these stories are designed to make a point. History is written by its authors to make a point. Most of the stories we teach in history are intended as lessons about the world or life. Sometimes the lessons are on perseverance like the story of the suffragettes fighting for voting rights for women, or stories of integrity and courage, like St. Thomas More, who refused to renounce his faith in the face of his friend, King Henry VIII's pressure that ultimately cost him his life. Sometimes the lesson is, don't march your horses into a bunch of cannon fire. Into the valley of death rode the 600. I think it's funny that we have a classic Tennyson poem about 600 dudes on horseback charging into cannons for a foolish, ill-advised run into a barrage of artillery in the Crimean War of 1854. I wonder if that lesson will come back. But it is a mistake to look at history as only a fact-based document. History is not simply facts written on a page of the official tomes of knowledge. Rather, it is a gathering of evidence from various sources, written, archaeological, cultural, interviews, etc., and comparing them to each other. Many times, contemporary news sources within history are not really available to us. There are hilariously few contemporary sources of information on Alexander the Great, for example. The story that we understand today of this 4th century BCE conqueror is compiled from mainly five sources dating between the 2nd and the 1st century. Century BCE. That's a two to four hundred year gap between. And those histories are not pure fact-based accounts. I'm sorry to tell you all, the Gordian Knot was not a real thing. Something a little bit more close to home for my American viewers is the stories that we tell about the Confederacy and the brilliance of their generals. Look at Robert E. Lee, paragon of military intellect, who, with cunning and tenacity, almost brought the Union to its knees except he wasn't that good of a general. He was personally responsible for the losses at Antietam and Gettysburg. He was hyper-aggressive with a smaller, less capable military. And apparently he didn't read that Tennyson poem as he ordered General Pickett to charge his troops into a larger force of cannons as well. This order was so unfathomably illogical, even at the time, that when General Pickett asked General Longstreet if he should advance his troops, Longstreet couldn't even make a sound. He was so embarrassed and melancholic about sending these men to die needlessly. These stories carry through the generations. Revolutions are no different. What's funny to me is that you have folks who see nothing but evil and malice when they look at the story of like Che Guevara or Fidel Castro's revolution in Cuba. 
And they venerate and glorify the founders of the United States as if they were religious figures. I want you to discard, as much as you can, founding myths from your mind. While modern revolutions like the American Revolution may have fewer myths than, say, the foundation of Rome, it is still rife with mythology. Some are evident, some are a little bit more subtle. Most people don't believe the story of George Washington cutting down the cherry tree when he was six years old. And when confronted, the future president reportedly said to his father, I cannot tell a lie, I did cut it with my hatchet. I know grown adults who aren't as eloquent as this fictitious kindergartner. But ask folks here why the Boston Tea Party happened, and they'll tell you a familiar myth of high taxes on tea and whatnot. But that's not true. That's not even remotely true. The tea tax was actually reduced in the Tea Act of 1773. Rather, the Boston Tea Party was about a mixture of taxation without representation, a general argument, and the fact that some founding fathers were tea smugglers, and they were losing money to legally ship tea. But that's not what the history class tells us. So let's discard the romance or revolution in our minds, like so much tea, into the harbor. Part 2. Casas Belli Marx stated that the revolution was not an outcome of specific event of discontentment that appeared in society. Rather, he states, revolution is a systematic feature of class struggle. Okay, Carl, you have my attention. Per Marx, the end of feudalism was due to the development and rise of the merchant class into the class of people that were powerful enough to overthrow the rulers who were in power. Then, as the merchant class transitioned into the bourgeoisie, the proletariat would follow a same pattern. Marx was wrong. Look, I'm not saying he's like 100% wrong, but he's not nearly 100% right either. I'm not actually going into the remainder of Marx's political thoughts in this video, but on this issue, which is outside of any debate discussing communism and its merits or deficiencies, his theories did not stand up to empirical historical review. One would only need to realize that the revolutionary sequence Marx brought up in his work never happened. While communist revolutions did happen, they didn't come out nearly in the manner that Marx had predicted. There is a reason empirical political theory and normative political theory are two very different things. It's like how an athlete in one sport can show amazing proficiency, and yet the same athlete can be so inept in another sport. It is near impossible to master two disciplines, even if they appear to have similar attributes. Unless you're Bo Jackson. Bo knows baseball. Football. That guy was featured in Major League Baseball's All-Star Game, then in the National Football League's Pro Bowl in back-to-back -back years. He is the only person to ever hold both honors. Bow no sports. The suffering of the peasants is not what spurs revolt. Think of it this way. If suffering was the instigation of rebellion, slave rebellions would have been ubiquitous. And I'm not denying that slave revolts actually happened. From Spartacus to Nat Turner, these revolts occurred throughout history. But only one was successful. I'm going to repeat that because I think it bears repeating. We've been having slave revolts documented for 2,400 years, and only one has ever been successful as a full revolution in the span of that time. That was the Haitian Revolution. Romantics, to the contrary, it is not easy for a peasantry to engage in sustained rebellions. Peasants are especially limited in their ability to pass from passive recognition of wrongs to political participation as a means for setting them right. The very nature of oppression is the reason for its continuation. Oppressors have the power in this situation. It isn't about a lack of will. The will is there. It's about a lack of means. The idea that the marginalized and oppressed have the means to bootstrap their way out of a situation almost feels like an additional method of control by those who are in power in a way to undermine the people who want to be free. If your cause was just, then you would succeed. All you need is grit and determination. Except that's not how systems work. Peasants are not peasants because of the unwillingness to fight for their freedoms. It is because the nobles have the money and weapons to prevent them from winning that fight. That isn't to say that anger among the general populace is not necessary. On the contrary, it is very necessary. It is one of the key elements of revolution. However, we should not engage with the fantasy that it is the only thing needed. We don't engage with fantasy on this channel. Okay, actually we do, like, a lot with, like, dragons and elves. You know what I mean. Part 3. The Algorithm of Revolution. Like I said before, everything is systems. Here is Dr. Joshua Lambert to explain. We have a vast array of explanations for these events. I mean, that that's sort of part of the the 
good part and the bad part of what has been the explosion of literature over recent years, which is everybody has a theory for, for why this event happens or this event's happened. And you can statistically investigate these things and, and, and show a lot of correlations and, and things like that that actually lend credence to that argument. Some are specific and carry really strong weight on a per case basis. Uh, we might tease these out through things like archival research or process tracing, case studies, um, and other such methods. And we can find a specific catalyst that lit the proverbial fire of rebellion. Other explanations have broad generalizability and can be useful in generating sort of like frameworks and lenses through which we can analyze, you know, events and even better be able to identify, you know, early warnings for when, you know, states may collapse, states may fall into rebellion or civil war, or, you know, maybe they're, the protests are going to emerge into something bigger. And so sometimes these broad-based models, they do have, you know, the, the capacity to obscure the nuance of particular series of events that led to, you know, a rebellion in a certain case or a re revolution in a certain case. For instance, we might say that income inequality is an important factor in, you know, revolutions. And while this might be true, it may not be the last straw, right? It might not be the thing that, that catalyzed everything. So no one participating in the French Revolution was asking what their Gini coefficient was before they participated in protests and riots and things like this, right? And without the combination of things such as, you know, the debt following years in the, in the Anglo-Saxon War and unfair taxation policies that are heteroscedastic across regions, massive spikes in population, and, and a larger backdrop of pro-liberal democracy ideas spawning across the globe, a theory of why this particular revolution occurred is ultimately underspecified. If you're curious, the Gini coefficient was developed by Italian sociologist Corrado Gini as a measure of income inequality. Zero is equality, and one is complete inequality, where only one person or group gets all of the money. Research indicates that the difference between shifting from a Gini index of 0.28, or relatively equal society, to an index of 45 will increase the probability of rebellion by fivefold. The United States currently sits at a 0.414. It is a field of study that tries to make sense of some of the most complex conflicts you have ever heard of, and many that you haven't. The most important war of the 21st century that you have never heard of, and that's the second war in the Congo. I mean, it's very messy. And while it's broad-based indicators such as economic despair was rampant, of course, by itself, this this has little explanatory power in the in this specific case. And, you know, this is a war that killed six million people. And I mean, this is one of the most complex conflicts to understand. I think Jason Stern's book, Dancing in the Glory of Monsters, is an excellent piece that helps to explain the many layers to the various groups that are in dissent, um, both with international support and without international support and why they did so. Uh, the messiness of the conflict is not just in deaths, but ideologies and ethnicities and colonial histories and various other cleavages that cut across these groups and make it hard to understand sides and factions. Understanding particular groups is really important for understanding when we think about rebellions and revolutions. It's it's not always easy to just say, oh, it's it's so clear that, you know, this led to this and this led to this and now we have a revolution. So what are the elements of a revolution? What is the actual special sauce that makes revolutions happen? Or more importantly, what makes them succeed? Theta Scotchpole outlines in her seminal work, States and Social Revolutions, first you need a crisis of state, then a peasant uprising. The class-based power dispute is key, but she's only discussing social revolutions, which is not only a change in political power, but the social structure as well. What do I mean by that? Let's put it this way. Scotland's war of independence from England is a political revolution. The power in politics changed hands, but the system and the society didn't really change. The English king was swapped out with a Scottish king, and the royals and nobility and peasants were largely unchanged. However, if you look at something like the French or Chinese or Russian revolutions, not only was the political power changed, but the social structures were altered as well. No longer were there nobles or royalty. Governments and social structures were altered as a result of the revolution. But different instances and groups do different things on the road to revolution. Let's just look at the basic revolution for a second. According to Professor Dame Stefranzo, there are five keys to a successful revolution. First, you need mass discontent amongst the population. This means large-scale protests and possibly armed rebellion. This is probably the easiest thing to see. It's what first gets the news headlines. But as we saw in Tiananmen Square, it doesn't always get the results that we want. Another example, maybe? Remember the Arab Spring? Massive anti-government protests all across the Arab world? Changing of the tide and the push for more democratic institutions and respect for human rights. Right? 
Well, what do we have to show for it? Three ongoing civil wars, Egypt overthrew its government twice and is still dealing with a rebellion in the Sinai, and its current government is executing human rights advocates every month. Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Algeria, all made very little concessions, if any, and stomped out the protest. What followed the Arab Spring was the Arab Winter, a time of resurgence of authoritarianism and religious extremism throughout the area. We're still hearing about it to this day, but it has different names. We call it ISIS. We call it the Libyan Civil War, the Yemeni Civil War, the Syrian Civil War. We call it the European Migrant Crisis. Protests, even massive protests, by themselves, don't create change or revolution. Take a moment. It's a sobering statement. But also remember that this is just the spark. How do these rebel groups recruit? How do they spread from the fringe organization to something that changes governments? And so when I think about revolutions, what makes some stick and some not stick, or in other words, why some grow and coalesce into this larger movement, forgive my uh, elementary framing, but you have to have a lot of people that are ticked off at the status quo. And so some revolutions will ultimately become successful in recruiting because of repression by the government. Uh, lack of rights, mistreatment by the by the government, extrajudicial behavior by the government, in other words, imprisoning people, killing people, repressing them in ways in which it's gotten to a point where it's intolerable. Oftentimes we see success when protest movements pick up within a country. Uh, those protest movements inspire. So what else do you need? You need uh, separation between the powerful and the ones in power. That may sound like weird wordplay, but bear with me. Just because you're in charge of the government doesn't mean that you're all of the elite. Nor does being an elite mean that you're automatically in power in the government. Think of the American Revolution. The Founding Fathers were not in charge of England. England controlled the government of the colonies. However, they were all rich landowners. These people were the powerful of the colonies. They held all the resources. As such, they had access to the wealth and power, were highly educated, and possessed the necessary skills required to operate a rebellion. We're talking people managers, veteran soldiers, commanders, accountants, lawyers. <laughs> These were people of letters, learning, money, and power. I know how much of a gut punch. It is to hear that garnering the elites to your side is necessary for a revolution. But history has shown us time and time again that it is necessary to any successful revolution. It happened in Russia, it happened in China, it happened in the United States, and the French Revolution, and many, many others throughout history. You can probably see how lacking this was a death blow to many revolutions before they even began. The issue becomes how do you get the elites to care? Well, that's where number three comes in. You need something that is powerful and unifies people across class. You need something that brings the majority of the population behind the revolution. Corruption, an economic downturn, things of that nature. In my opinion, this is a little duplicative of number one or two. Other similar theories don't include this one, as widespread protests and inclusion of revolutionary elites kind of already covers these bases. But one can look at the military as part of the elite as well. They are literally the the ones with the guns. More often than not, revolutions are suppressed by the military. Historically, they're very good at this job. I think it's the military looking out for their best interest and making a calculated gamble on what they think will be better for their institution, whether it's a post-conflict setting or a post-protest setting. Care to take a tangent with me? The United States military has the largest budget of any military on the planet. Our defense spending is greater than China, Russia, and the United Kingdom. Heck, it's larger than the next nine top spending countries in the world combined. It's over one third of the budget. In 2017, of the 734.34 billion dollars we spent on defense in the United States, 250.8 billion was spent on benefits and payments, 34% of the total amount of the budget. It's designed to keep the military in a privileged position, to maintain them at the 70th percentile compared to civilians' pay and benefits. We don't generally think of having a warrior caste in this country, but we, like most nations, do create a separation in their military. They try to separate them from the civilian population by sequestering them on bases and creating their own cultures within those places. Consider the People's Liberation Army of China. Consider the current protests in Iran and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. Iran's done a really good job of empowering the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, more or less insulating the regime in a different way than Tunisia. Might, might have had, similar to something like the uh, Chinese Communist Party and the relationship with the People's Liberation Army, where you've empowered this institution in a way that ensures they're getting kickbacks, you know, they're in privileged positions within society, you name it, they're kind of the elite 
military institution in Iran. I think there's loyalty there that will ensure the regime is more or less insulated. Getting the military on your side could be the determining factor in a revolution. But something to consider, nonviolent protests historically garner more military support. The more a revolution turns into a violent rebellion, the more the military feels justified in killing civilians. In fact, the army would be seldom deployed against peaceful and orderly demonstrations, and if it were, it would rarely suppress them violently. To be sure, occasionally, even peaceful marches are crushed by the military. But it is certainly a rare occurrence and tends to foreshadow a regime's uncompromising stance towards demonstrations. So this becomes a balancing act. Do you test what you can do against the military? Do you fight them? Do you attempt to curry favor with them? Depends on the situation. There's no gaining support from an occupying foreign army, but when it comes to a domestic army, the situation is a lot more complicated. Fourth, the state must find itself in a crisis that weakens its ability to fight off the protest. When the cat's away, the mice will play. Look at something like China during the revolution. China had come off of losses to the Japanese in the first Sino-Japanese War, but the Chinese revolution really comes in during the 1920s. Mao and his revolutionaries began the revolution in rural areas, counting on the central government's inability to combat them so far away from their centers of power. The first years of the revolution did not go well. In 1927, the Chinese Communist Party lost thousands to massacres by the Republic. They even tried to stage a large-scale military rebellion in 1927, and they lost. China, even under the strain that it was in, was able to weather the storm of the revolutionaries. By 1928, things looked grim for Mao and his revolution. Then the Soviets invaded. Oh, I'm sorry, did you not know that the Soviet Union invaded China in 1929? This further weakened the Chinese central government. The communists launched another rebellion in 1930 as a response, and it failed again. Then in 1931, the Japanese army fabricated a terrorist attack on the railways as a pretense to secure their hold on more territory in China. Forces came in and occupied Korea and invaded Manchuria. This was a precursor to the eventual invasion of China by Japan in 1937. In the West, we usually measure World War II as starting when Germany invaded Poland in 1939. In Asia, the war started years before. The Japanese invasion ravaged the Chinese Republic. And all the while, they were still focused on the extermination of the communists. And the Chinese economy goes into a depression because of an influx of cheap American goods. I'm sorry, the irony. History is a wild story when you really get into it, folks. The pendulum swings. Time is a flat circle. So we have a country ravaged by war. A military of the government was shrunk due to massive losses in a conflict against Japan. The economy had grown feeble and had a lack of real international support. The United States was more interested in keeping its economic interests and really not dedicated to the full support of the Chinese Republic, while the communists had the assistance of regional powers like the Soviet Union, Mongolia, and even North Korea. Which brings us to the fifth factor, international permission. Foreign support matters a lot. Are these organizations, these rebel groups, successfully attracting international resources? And that can be formal, informal. That can be as little as legitimacy provided to the rebel organization from an outside actor via the recognition of them. It could be something like the Islamic State developing fringe organizations or franchises in other countries. Just that recognition that you are a member of this this more powerful organization in another territory can generate recruitment success. It could be something more tangible. Are you receiving foreign support in the form of money or guns? Even recruits in some cases are, uh, you know, another government sending foreign fighters to your, to your organization. The Soviet army was stationed in Manchuria and refused to leave after the Japanese surrender. They supported the communists. The central Chinese government could not sustain the conflict. Conscripted peasants were deserting en masse and bringing their equipment with them to support the communists. Then, in 1949, after 28 years of revolution, in Tiananmen Square, the new People's Republic of China was established. And all was well in China from there on, right? Part 4. The Terrible Reality of Revolution Revolutions are not pretty. They're not quick. They are not clean. War is the worst of mankind. 
and revolutionary wars are some of the worst of war. Civil wars are some of the most devastating events in the history of any nation. The United States Civil War was more deadly than almost all of the other wars in US history combined. Of the deadliest conflicts in human history, the highest death toll was World War II. The second, the combined total invasions of the Mongolian Empire. But numbers three through six were all revolutions and rebellions in China. The French Revolution had about 2.5 million military casualties with another million civilian casualties. But what's key to understand here is not just the military casualties. There is a bitter reality of revolution that folks who call for it don't seem to track. Whatever the starting goal of the revolution, authoritarianism and death usually follows. Dr. Lambert's research and reading agrees. So I think in today's climate, we need to be cognizant, not just of the events and, and the groups driving the events, but what it might look like as a consequence five, 10 years down the road. In their model, they articulate a revolutionary reactive sequence is what they call it, whereby more often than not, when regimes formed in the fires of revolution are faced with an equal but opposite reaction or a counter-revolution, as is often the case, they are faced with a choice to concede some power, in which case the regime will likely fail or to entrench themselves by coercing or developing strong, loyal military and civilian power apparatus, thereby leading to regime durability. It is the nature of how these revolutionary governments survive. Make no mistake, the way that nation states withstand the onslaught of exterior and interior threats and pressures is not fairy tale business. So the ideal revolutionary case is the case of China. This is one of them. The Chinese revolutions in the 1920s, which was triggered state, you know, in total disarray and civil upheaval for, for a couple of decades after that. But it ultimately bred a strong and cohesive military and civil apparatus or elite apparatus, right? Where they used ideology and, and various bonds that they formed during, during that period of disarray to maintain authority at, at all kinds of levels, right? And we see events precipitate in China, you know, like the Tiananmen Square, where the regime manages to survive that and appears to remain one of the most entrenched global authoritarian regimes in the modern world. And so it's really important to understand what regime durability can lead to, too. You know, it's like sometimes these entrenched policies can lead to strong politics where they, they can, you know, maintain ideologies over long periods of time. Similar revolutionary durable regimes that are argued in the book as, as being exemplary of this case are the Soviet Union and Mexico, Vietnam, Cuba, Iran. Now, Dr. Lambert wanted me to make it clear that this doesn't mean that we like that this happens. It's simply that it is the way the system plays out. Recommended reading would be Revolutions in Dictatorship, The Violent Origins of Durable Authoritarianism by Stephen Levitsky and Lucian Wei for more information on the relationship between revolution and authoritarianism. And it keeps happening time and time again from Oliver Cromwell in the English Civil War to China to France to Cuba. And we can't ignore the aftermath of all these revolutions. However, it isn't all bleak. There are examples of positive, relatively non-violent rebellions happening. I'll reference one that I would call a revolution with uh, the Tunisian revolution in 2011, kind of kicking off the Arab Spring. Why is something like that successful in the face of violent repression historically in a military that had, in previous junctures throughout history, been willing to abuse the population, repress protests? In this case, Things like food insecurity, economic deprivation, ultimately led to successful protest movements. And subsequently, the military, for a whole bunch of reasons, decided we no longer will stand by the leader. We're not going to fire into peaceful protesters. The dynamic and complicated relationship between populations and the military can be the difference between bloodshed and peace. Part 5. Conclusion. We hate reality. It is why we tell ourselves these stories, why we make our history into legends, because we honestly don't want to know the truth. We want to wear our Che Guevara t-shirts and watch Hamilton the musical and not think about the realities of what really happened. The blood shed was those of tyrants and patriots, the noble rebels, the evil empire. We want Star Wars, but we got Game of Thrones. And folks, please stop charging into cannons. It's really never a good idea. Look, I see a lot of people wanting it, wanting change. Who doesn't? We all want the world to be a better place. Many of us have vastly different ideas of what that means. And I hate some of the ideas that folks have for my home country and the world in general. But 
when we look at something like revolutions, like with anything else, we need to look at it with informed minds. We need to stop examining anything uncritically. Only when we face the truth can we combat the errors of the past. Only when we understand the system can we alter it. Thanks for watching.